Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is Matt Schultz from uh, Grand Valley State University, and um, uh, I'm sure several of you on the call here are probably wondering uh, where are the usual intrepid uh, co-chairs, um, uh, Corey Davis and Nathan Tellman. Um, I think both of them are at IPRES um, this week. Uh, I know at least uh, Nathan is. So. Um, uh, so folks who don't know me, um, I'm uh, the curation and digital preservation librarian uh, at Grand Valley State University Libraries, um, and we have been a member of the National Digital Stewardship Alliance for almost a couple years now. Um, and uh, I'm typically uh, doing co-chair duties with uh, Lauren Work from UVA on the content interest group, and um, uh, I've been over the past year and a half or so uh, helping to spin up what we've been calling this subgroup on cloud studies. Um, and uh, that's really where today's uh, session is coming from. So uh, folks may or may not know if you've been a regular uh, attendee to the infrastructure group calls. Um, Nathan and Corey have been working with all the folks who uh, typically attend those calls to set up uh, some good topics throughout the course of the year here. Um, they chose uh, this September call to uh, go ahead and liaise with me a bit uh, in my role with the cloud study subgroup. Uh, because there's so much great overlap between uh, what you all are focusing on uh, in these conversations with the infrastructure interest group, uh, with uh, some of the things that we've been exploring over the past year and a half in the cloud studies group, uh, it was a great opportunity to kind of bring the two groups together here. Um, so they've invited me in uh, to replicate to some degree some of the conversations that we've been having uh, on the cloud studies group. Uh, and uh, primarily over the past year and a half, we have been uh, doing a couple of uh, core things. We've been really sort of scanning the environment to see uh, what institutions are making use of in terms of resources um, and what uh, institutions need in terms of new resources for uh, navigating uh, all of the, the trend that we're, uh, we're in the stream of within our cultural sector, within our scholarly sector. Uh, of migrating um, to cloud infrastructures, both for storage and for different curation uh, services. So um, one of the things that sort of coalesced on that resources side of things is we've started um, working as a, uh, as a bit of a subgroup within the cloud studies um, conversations to explore uh, the, the construction of some resources that um, our institutions can use when we're dialoguing with, um, with different service providers uh, that are offering cloud um, platform services. Uh, particularly in the area of data integrity um, and data fixity. Uh, so we're, we've got some ongoing um, explorations and research and development that we're doing to try and build out some advocacy resources that can bridge uh, those sorts of conversations um, with institutions and providers. Um, and we've also been inviting in uh, different service providers to come and talk with us about uh, how their services relate to uh, digital preservation, uh, particularly in areas of our cultural heritage sector and uh, in our, in our um, scholarly sector. Uh, so we've been having really great conversations with, um, with providers like Amazon uh, and Wasabi. And um, uh, so those conversations have been really fruitful. I think they've helped to establish uh, some new good connections between our sector and those, uh, those um, corporations. And uh, um, that, those conversations uh, fold into uh, different events that we hold throughout the year. So certainly at PASIG and things like um, the Library of Congress storage architectures um, uh, conversations that are had uh, every year. Um, and so we're developing a really good rapport with, um, uh, with different service providers. And um, so in an effort for today's call to sort of replicate some of the conversations that we've been having in the Cloud Studies group, um, really wanted to kind of aim to bring uh, the two worlds together to some degree. Uh, and focus a little bit on this topic of fixity that has come to the forefront of our conversations. Um, so I uh, have reached out to um, uh, the folks at Wasabi, who if folks have been keeping up with uh, the recordings from our Cloud Studies call, they'll know that um, uh, we heard from David Friend, um, who's the chief executive there at Wasabi. He met with, uh, with our group and had great conversations. Um, and Wasabi has proven to be um, a, a very transparent uh, commercial provider, um, and they're interested in having more and more conversations with us. Um, and so, so reached out to uh, Wasabi, uh, made uh, further contacts with, um, with David Bolin, uh, who's the product marketing uh, director, uh, and with Jim Donovan, who's the uh, VP of product there at Wasabi. And they were 
more than happy to come in and uh, engage in some conversations uh, around this, this issue of fixity and um, how our curation activities uh, function in an environment like, uh, like what they're providing services for. Um, and then also uh, reached out to uh, some groups who are operating at some similar sort of cloud scales of service um, and that are a bit more embedded within our, our sector. So uh, organizations that some of you, your institutions uh, may in fact be members of. Uh, so uh, Sam Meister is with us. He's the program manager from the Meta Archive Cooperative. Um, and then Andrew Diamond, who's the lead developer of AP Trust. Um, have invited them to come in and uh, engage in some conversations around these these topics and just kind of give us a little bit of a better sense of um, as we as institutions are trying to make use of um, uh, these different uh, cloud services and different distributed digital preservation services, um, uh, how our concerns how are addressed in their their environments and they've agreed to to come on board and, um, and have these conversations. So I just want to start by issuing a uh, huge thank you to them uh, and the time that they're taking out with us uh, to have these conversations. I'm gonna let them uh, introduce themselves a little bit more fully in just a second. Um, but uh, before we dive into hearing from them and having some conversation, I've got a, a host of different questions kind of queued up uh, to throw at them. Uh, we'll have time for you all to, to throw some questions at them. Just wanna make sure that we're all kind of on the same page with uh, housekeeping. Uh, so, uh, if folks would, um, at this time, go ahead and uh, mute your mics on your computers uh, and on your phones as we dive into the conversations. Um, unless there's some sort of um, uh, technical issue that we need to troubleshoot uh, in the midst of the, the, the panel, uh, we'll ask that you just go ahead and um, uh, make use of the chat uh, towards the end of the call um, to put your questions into. And like I said, we'll leave some good time for questions uh, toward the end. Uh, we, we are recording this call. Um, the plan is for us to go through the hour um, to hear from um, uh, David and Jim and uh, Sam and, uh, and Andrew. Uh, as we reach the top of the hour, um, depending on where we're at in, in the conversations, uh, we hopefully can make use of an additional maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, to get some closing comments from them. Uh, make sure your questions are addressed. If for whatever reason, uh, Zoom, and I don't think that this will happen, but if for whatever reason, uh, Zoom cuts us off at the top of the hour, um, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to encourage uh, David and Jim and Sam and Andrew to at some point uh, can be, you know, um, over the course of the, the discussions, uh, if you would just uh, throw your contact, the best contact information for your organizations or for yourself into the, the chat so folks can uh, can have that and if they have some follow-up questions if for whatever reason the call uh, clips off at the top of the hour or we get cut off at any point um, folks can follow up with some of the questions that they may have about your your services so I see um, David is throwing his contact information in there um, appreciate that um, and uh, with that I think uh, we're all set to go I'm seeing most folks uh, aside from our panelists have got their their mics uh, mics muted and I think I'm gonna uh, start by turning it over to um, the folks at Wasabi, uh, maybe starting with you, David, if you wouldn't mind, um, just introduce yourself, uh, describe your role at your organization and uh, maybe explain how your, uh, the operations there at Wasabi support uh, digital preservation, uh, provide some persistent storage for institutions, um, and then maybe say a little bit about what sorts of institutions you consider to be your primary market. Um, we'll start with, uh, uh, with uh, David and Jim, and then we'll turn to Sam and, um, uh, and Andrew. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is David Friend. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of, uh, of Wasabi. And Wasabi launched uh, in um, May of 2017. Um, all we do is cloud storage, cloud object storage. Uh, our product is designed to be plug compatible with uh, Amazon S3. Um, and uh, we are uh, an inexpensive, uh, very reliable, high quality cloud storage product. Um, our price is $6 per terabyte per month. And uh, we offer uh, speeds that are comparable or better, we think, than uh, the other cloud services that are out there. And durability is 11 nines. We offer immutable buckets, which is something which we, I think we were one of the first cloud service providers to offer immutability. 
uh, as a way to protect against accidental or malicious uh, damage or alteration of files. And uh, today we have about uh, close to 11,000 customers. Um, we have about 120 plus universities using Wasabi today for uh, various kinds of storage and archival purposes. We have um, a couple of hundred technology alliance partners who are companies whose products uh, utilize Wasabi storage or with whom we partner to provide complete solutions. And uh, Jim can talk uh, a little bit more about that. Um, our vision as a company is that uh, cloud storage uh, should be um, essentially a commodity, um, high speed, low cost, uh, and ubiquitous. Uh, we, we don't have any egress fees or API call charges because we want the bills to be simple. Um, one of the things that we heard from people who are migrating to the cloud for the first time is that they really don't know what their, uh, what their bills are going to be because a, a lot of the things that are components of a, of a bill, uh, such as egress fees and so forth, are things that they don't meter in the on-premises world. And, uh, you know, they were made made it very difficult to predict what it was going to cost to move to the cloud. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, if you look at uh, Amazon's price list, they, they'll have one price for storage and another price for egress and, and your bill will be, you know, the total of those. But if you're touching your data frequently, the egress could uh, be as or more expensive than the storage. And uh, we decided to go a different direction, which is that uh, we'll, we'll offer the egress free. And uh, once in a while, we get a, a customer that abuses this sort of all you can eat privilege, um, but we don't have hard and fast rules about it. Um, and uh, it's kind of on a case by case basis, but we very rarely have any, any issues with the policy and it just makes life so much easier for everybody. Uh, I think that's about all I, I need to say uh, by way of intro. Um, there is obviously a lot of technology behind what we do and how we can do it so inexpensively and, and get the kind of performance that we get. And uh, Jim can probably talk more to that, but uh, you know, I'll just say a little bit more about our partnerships because uh, almost everybody in the software world now is building S3 API connectors onto their products. So we have, you know, in the sort of backup and archiving world, uh, people like ArcServe, Actifio, Veeam, Rubrik, Preservica, Comprise, Versity, Commvault uh, as, as alliance partners. And uh, we have, you know, many customers who are using products like those to uh, perform the you know backup or archiving uh, and data management functions with uh, Wasabi in the background as the data storage. Most of our business is coming from companies who are moving to the cloud for the first time. Um, and they're looking at places where they can store their data. And sometimes they store one copy of their data with one vendor and another copy of their data with, with us. And, uh, you know, obviously we're fine with that as well. Um, so I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Jim, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Thanks, David. Oh, one thing I, I just forgot to mention, we have uh, 11, over 1,100 bars and MSPs today who, uh, you know, sell to uh, all manner of institutions, including a lot of universities. And right now we have... Uh, four data centers, two in the East Coast, one on the West Coast, one in Amsterdam. And in uh, this fall, we will be opening our first data center in Tokyo. So we'll have uh, then have five data centers and we plan to about triple that number by the end of next year. Fantastic. 
And, and Matt, this is uh, Jim Donovan. I, I know you prepared a lot of good technical questions, so I'll probably hold off my remarks and just answer them in the context of, of your questions. Yeah, that's great. But just to say a little bit about your role there. Oh, sure. Yeah, I run the uh, product management team, so responsible for building the product as well as the uh, deploying it and helping our customers integrate it into their preservation environments. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Sam. Sure. Uh, thanks again, Matt, for, for the invitation. Uh, really excited uh, to be here, to be uh, able to participate in the conversation and, and represent uh, Meta Archive Cooperative and happy to see some familiar names uh, amongst members and other, other friends in the participants list. Um, so uh, yeah, briefly, uh, I'll say that my role uh, is as a community manager for the Meta Archive Cooperative, uh, and I've been in this role for about four years now, um, and really I'm the sort of point person for, for all things Meta Archive, um, everything from technical network operations to member engagement, all those pieces. Um, so, uh, I've been with Meta Archive for four years, but Meta Archive has been around, the cooperative has been around for uh, going on 15 years now. Um, and just for folks that don't already know, Meta Archive is, it's an independent membership organization um, and uh, really a, a community of practice around digital preservation with the, the core service being a distributed storage network. Um, and uh, from the early days of uh, its existence, uh, Meta Archive was uh, one of the first implementers of the uh, LOX software protocol. So lots of copies keep stuff safe um, and implemented that uh, so that uh, we could accept and preserve content uh, of any shape, size, format data. Um, so beyond the original use case of locks preserving electronic journals. Um, so one of the main sort of, uh, I guess, differences in infrastructure uh, is that all, all of the, the hardware and software components are sort of uh, owned and managed and operated by member institutions. Um, so as a, as a cooperative, uh, Meta Archive has a leadership group, a governance group that, that manages all of the decision making and uh, cost structures and all of the, the sort of daily and uh, yearly strategic thinking that goes on uh, for, for the, the community entity. Um, and so my role um, is really just to help support those activities. Um, but, but it's really led and steered by, by the membership uh, itself. Um, and so as a, as a storage network, um, you know, there are uh, multiple members that are hosting infrastructure. We have around uh, 14 different storage nodes uh, currently in the network. Um, most of those uh, are, are academic uh, library environments, um, but we, we have increased the opportunities for um, institutions of various shapes and sizes, small public libraries, small museums, um, opportunities for institutions to band together as consortia to, to join. Um, so there's definitely been a strong uh, intention and, and mission of Meta Archive to make participation and the sort of work of doing digital preservation more feasible and, and more affordable for a, a wider a wider array of institutions and particularly those sort of smaller institutions with with very limited resources um, so in terms of the uh i guess how the storage function works um Again, there are some so basic. We can, sure. I was just going to say, Sam, we can um, we can get into a little bit more of the the way that the the systems work in, in a few seconds. Um, would it be okay if we uh, went ahead and let Andrew go ahead and uh, yeah. introduce himself, and then I've got uh, I've got some questions we can dive into. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Can everyone? And, Andrew, go ahead and um, uh, real quick give us kind of a breakdown of your role in AP Trust and. Um, uh, who AP Trust is sort of geared to help in terms of digital preservation and digital curation. 
Okay, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, um, my name is Andrew Diamond. I'm the lead developer here at AP Trust. And uh, AP Trust provides distributed digital preservation services to a number of universities. So far, almost all our members are universities. We're a member organization, so um, each of our depositors pays an annual fee plus uh, whatever amount of storage they're using. We've traditionally served large universities. Um, and in the last year or year and a half, we have allowed those universities to create sub accounts so that smaller organizations uh, with, with lighter preservation needs and less budget can join AP trusts through uh, a university in their area. Um, so we've picked up a number of sub accounts. They tend to be, uh, they can be other organizations within the university or they can be local libraries or um, what do you call them? Sorry, I can't remember the word, like historical society type organizations. Mm -hmm. um, we run entirely in the cloud. We run our, our ingest and restoration services uh, on AWS. And we currently do all of our storage in AWS, though we plan to uh, start offering Wasabi as a storage option sometime in the coming months. I was gonna work on that this month, but I'm behind on too many other things. But hopefully October, um, we'll bring Wasabi on. Um, yeah, do you need more of a general intro or, or does that cover who I am and what we're doing? Yeah, no, I think that that's great. Um, and I think the, you know, just hearing from each one of you, uh, hope everybody is kind of getting the sense, th three very different uh, platforms and infrastructures, uh, very different models for, um, you know, uh, both engaging institutions and enlisting institutions. Um, and again, yeah, I'll just uh, encourage everyone, the folks have thrown their contact information in the chat. If you're just joining by phone, um, I'll make sure to distribute the uh, contact info for each of the, the panelists after the call here and you can follow up with them. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, their service models. Um, I also just wanna say before we dive into these more specific questions around how you all um, sort of manage data integrity, uh, in your services and your systems um, that uh, did make a, an attempt to reach out to Amazon and invite them in. Um, and uh, so Mike Davis, we heard from him uh, this summer. Uh, the recording has been made, made available for that from the Cloud Studies Group and uh, can, can share that on the heels of uh, the notes going out for this call as well. Folks should go back and listen to that. Um, Mike Davis was great, talked a lot about um, how Amazon is working with our sector um, they were invited to come on the call. Um, a couple of folks were put forward uh, to take the place of Mike this time around. Uh, they ended up having a conflict uh, with the schedule so they couldn't join us. Uh, they send their regrets. Uh, they said that they'd, they'd love to be able to engage our community further through these sorts of uh, formats. So um, yeah, hopefully we, we can either have them on the infrastructure call or again on the cloud studies uh, call to get a little bit more deeper into the weeds on these sorts of issues. But um, I do wanna uh, just, you know, dive in and um, if you would, each of you just kind of work through uh, very quickly and say a little bit about um, uh, what sort of fixity standards uh, you all uh, deploy in your services um, that you make use of for verifying, you know, the bit le level integrity for uh, data that uh, is at rest in your, your storage environments. Um, make that a little bit clearer for folks if you could. Um, and then, you know, uh, if you could say a little bit about uh, your standards and whether or not they are sort of placing any requirements or dependencies on, on data owners and depositors. Uh, so, for example, do they have to provide you with uh, some checksums before they deposit their data? Um, or are they, you know, once they're making use of your service, are they uh, required to follow your fixity st standards in order to verify um, the integrity of their data, uh, for example, like on an egress? Um, so if you could make that a little bit clear uh, each in your turn, you know, for your systems and services, how that works, what sort of standards you're, um, you're making use of. And I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and say, let's go ahead and start with Wasabi. Uh, maybe Jim, you can make that clear. 
Sure. So uh, I'll kind of take a look at the, the life of a file from the time it leaves the um, university or, or preservation environment to the time it lands in our service. So certainly, you know, files come to us in, in a number of different forms. Sometimes they're in their native form. Sometimes they're in, encapsulated, encrypted as part of some application that's doing that before it sends it to us. So certainly cloud storage services like Wasabi, we're, we're not doing any sort of deduplication. So we basically take whatever file you send us, it, you know, typically it's, it's send it over encrypted transport, HTTPS. Sometimes the files are encrypted, sometimes they're not. Um, we certainly encrypt all files at rest when they land in our service. Uh, and as part of that upload function, there is a MD5 level integrity check that's done as part of the transfer. So if for some reason the transfer gets uh, impaired um, due to integrity process perspective. So that's kind of a fixity level check that takes place um, during the file upload period. And, and as part of the, the messaging that takes place as, as part of the file transfer, you're certainly informed of, of any challenges. And, and that applies to both uh, single part as well as multi-part. There's a, there's a technique in, in S3 style storage known as multi-part. So when you have these very large files, it will basically chunk them up into individual parts to make for more efficient transport. So it's a pretty robust mechanism. And for those of you who have worked with AWS object storage in the past, then you'll find Wasabi works in an identical manner. Uh, once the file is actually living uh, at rest on Wasabi, then anytime you do a read of that file, uh, whether it's you're pulling it back for usage purposes or whether your application environment is doing a, uh, an integrity check on, on a periodic basis, then certainly that, that MD5 check takes place um, at that time as well. Uh, in addition to the upload, download related integrity checks, uh, every 90 days, we also do an integrity check uh, more at the disk block level uh, to protect against um, issues as it pertains to bit rot. Um, so we don't really have the same type of uh, challenges like you might have in a magnetic tape environment where magnetic tape may degrade over time. Um, but it's, it's still something that every 90 days we do an integrity check of, of the file and uh, report back any problems that may come as a result of that. So certainly something upload, download, as well as every 90 days. And, and then from your storage application, you have the option of, of querying uh, that file from an integrity perspective as, as often as you wish. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Sam, same question. Sure, and I'll just provide a, a disclaimer that um, there's much more detail <laughs> to what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'll, I'll maybe throw a link in the chat for people that, that want to learn more, more. But this is mostly about how integrity checking works within uh, a locks peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, you know, decentralized network. Um, so uh, yeah, at, at sort of a high level, um, the the ongoing sort of monitoring and integrity checking is performed through this this function called the library content audit protocol or LCAP, um, and so through through LCAP and Locks, um, all of the peers are essentially mutually distrusting of each other. So all of the individual storage nodes have you know multiple copies of of uh, data that's. Uh, distributed on ingest. Um, so I guess similar in terms of, you know, member uh, would would make content available to the network, um, locks functions as a, a set of web crawlers um, to, to crawl the content and sort of pull it into the system. So it's sort of staged and then pulled in. Um, there's no requirement um, on the part of, you know, a member user to provide checksums or, you know, have performed some kind of fixity check uh, prior to ingest. Um, we've definitely come to embrace uh, bag it bags as a packaging mechanism, a sort of simplified way of uh, packaging content for ingest and management and restoration. Um, it's, it's that, again, is not a requirement, um, but it's highly encouraged. Um, so in those uh, scenarios, um, then, you know, the content would be coming, you know, with the, the manifest 
uh, within the bags themselves. Um, and those would be stored and managed in, in the network. Um, but again, there's no requirement that uh, there's any kind of integrity check previous to ingest. Um, so once it is uh, ingested and then uh, those copies are replicated to multiple locations, uh, the, the LCAP protocol kicks off and, and starts to conduct a series of randomized polls um, where one, uh, one storage node with copies of content of a given file uh, or in locks term sort of archival unit, which is just you know, a grouping of content, could be one file, could be multiple files. Um, it will kick off a process of uh, requesting uh, that its, uh, its integrity be verified with other copies across the network. Um, and it does that in a way uh, that it, it doesn't automatically trust the content at other machines, but um, it sort of uh, employs um, some mechanisms to ensure that um, those nodes uh, trust each other and sort of go through a series of steps um, before they get to the point of then verifying that their hashes or their checksums match. Um, so again, there's uh, sort of rigorous uh, thought and computer science behind all this, and I'm happy to, uh, to share some links with that. Um, but in the case of um, those polls being conducted, and again, multiple nodes are being asked to participate. Um, if there is verification, if there is, if there is match, then it's successful and you know, things proceed to the next batch of content. Um, if, if there is a mismatch, if there is sort of a, a disagreement in, in those uh, checksum values, um, then uh, that's likely an indication of a corruption or you know, some, sort, some sort of issue with that copy of the content um, and an automatic repair process kicks in, um, again, based, based on the trust that's been built up uh, between those copies on those different nodes in the network that will automatically kick in and restore a trusted copy um, to repair uh, the, the issue that's occurred. Um, and so some of this can be uh, tuned within the network in terms of the sort of frequency of, of when um, the randomized polls kick off, but they're, they're happening on a regular basis. And again, depending on the sort of batch size of the content, um, you know, they may take more or less time to complete working through that, that checksum verification, but it's ongoing and regular, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the time sort of post ingest that, uh, uh, you know, a, a batch of content is, is pushed into the network. Yeah, that's fantastic, Sam. And um, I guess I'll, I guess I'll say from someone who had to kind of spend some time in the trenches with locks and you know kind of go through the learning curve of uh, that system. Uh, Sam, you just did an amazing job of explaining how locks works. <laughs> so, kudos. Um, so, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about how this works in AP Trust? Yeah. So, depositors submit materials to AP Trust in bagged format, which means that we have a checksum for each file that's submitted. Some of our depositors um, use MD5 as the checksum algorithm and some use SHA-256. When we receive a bag, we validate the, uh, all of the checksums of all of the files in the bag. And we actually, um, check both the MD5 and SHA-256, even if the depositor included only one of those. Uh, we calculate both and keep them on record. We store the files individually in preservation storage. So we don't store the entire bag as a unit, uh, but we pick out each file, store each one individually. And then we do checksums. We calculate fixity on those files every 90 days for all of the files in the system. And um, I think at this point that may be overkill given the reliability of S3 storage. But um, when AP Trust started back in 2014, most of our depositors had no experience with the cloud 
and um, they wanted a high level of assurance. So we're still doing those fixity checks every 90 days and um, we record premise events, you know, the, the fixity check was performed at such and such date and time. And this was the, uh, we record the outcome of the fixity check. Um, and we have a few limitations with that as well, with that fixity checking service. For, uh, for files that are stored in Glacier, we tell our depositors, we don't do fixity on those because it's, um, there's too much overhead in retrieving content from Glacier. And there's also uh, some access charges that can apply to, to pulling material out of Glacier. And if we're doing fixity checks every 90 days, those charges can add up. Um, one other, I, I don't know if I'd call it a limitation, but um, something we considered during the implementation of this fixity checking service was that the computer actually doing the fixity checking should be in the same data center as the S3 files that it's checking on. Um, otherwise things can, can get to be a bit slow. Mm. So we found that uh, calculating fixity on all these files is not as computationally taxing as we thought it would be. The, the bottleneck is actually bandwidth. Mm. And, um, you know, we have a way to, to calculate the fixity without ever writing the file to disk, which speeds things up tremendously. But even with that, there are some considerations, like we could probably do fixity checking on a very low powered AWS server, but the way they structure those servers is that the lower powered, cheaper ones have very limited bandwidth. And um, it actually doesn't make sense to try to run a lot of fixity checks on one of their cheap servers. So uh, what we've done is we have a fairly powerful server that handles ingest and restoration and some of the other heavy operations. And we can run the fixity checks on that server, which has a lot of bandwidth. Um, we can run the fixity checks in the idle time between ingests and, and other jobs. And that's worked out pretty well. It basically with that setup, we have, I think it's zero cost for the ongoing fixity checks. Um, we also do fixity checks when we restore bags. We reassemble the bag and we make sure that every single file we put into the reassembled bag is still intact. Um, you know, I have some ideas. I, I don't know if the old notion of having to check fixity on every file every 90 days is actually, if that applies to cloud storage. Um, but I think that might be a, another conversation. I, I do think at the very least we could be calculating fixity like once a year on many of these files and that mm. would be adequate. But um, again, that's probably another conversation. And it might be contentious for some people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I, I'm glad you're sort of teeing it up though as a as a future conversation. Yeah, you know, I think either in the infrastructure group uh, and or in the cloud studies group, um, that there's all sorts of time and fodder for for get, getting into that. Um, and it's a timely timely question for sure. Um, and you've actually, uh, Andrew, you've kind of uh, segued into uh, my next question. Um, you know, I, I sort of framed this uh, initially as, you know, being sort of a computationally intensive um, issue, the whole uh, challenge of scaling uh, fixity services, particularly for things, you know, like uh, large objects, uh, for example, like um, uh, audio video recordings or, um, you know, lots of uh, aggregations of lots of files, um, you know, sometimes things that we run into with uh, research data, for example. Um, uh, certainly the experience from an end user perspective is that, you know, uh, 
running fixity and verifying fixity at those sorts of levels um, definitely is a is a time intensive process uh, and there are bottlenecks you've just sort of raised the uh, the sort of network um, barriers to, to doing that sort of thing. And I appreciate you talking a little bit about how you benchmark that and how you've sort of optimized your services to, to reduce those bottlenecks. Um, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to, um, uh, to Jim to say a little bit about uh, how, that, how that surfaces for you all in Wasabi and what you have done to overcome some of those bottlenecks. And then we'll, we'll hear from Sam. Uh, sure, and, and first I wanted just to kind of compliment something that um, I, Sam had said earlier because when he talked about the reliability of, of object storage and how that affects the, the need for fixity and one thing I didn't really expand upon in my answer is that object storage services whether it's AWS's or ours I mean part of the reason why I think fixity is is not as important as it was in the tape environment is, is essentially cloud object storage services uh, will use an erasure coding mechanism. So essentially when you send us a file, you're, you're gonna, you know, in our case, we store 20 copies of that file. So it's not just like a single file living on a single tape reel. So that even if one of those copies was impaired on a disk, for example, you're able to rebuild that um, uh, file from other copies of the file. So we can actually, when we write to, uh, a file to object storage, we're, we're writing it to 20 different disks and 20 different servers. You can actually lose up to four of those servers before you start eating into the data durability of 11.9. So certainly that that changes the, the game a little bit. And, and then when um, Andrew was talking about um, costs and glacier and things like that, and then that's part of the reason why we do what we do when it comes to not charging for egress or, or request charges. So for our customers that do want to run periodic fixity checks, they don't have to worry about request charge. So there's no additional cost to do a read of that file as part of a fixity check. But to your, to your specific question about the, the computational, computational intensity of doing fixity check, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And that, that's part of the reason why uh, we only run our uh, checking every 90 days because as you might imagine, and we have some customers that literally store billions of files with us. And if we had to do a fixity check on every single file uh, on demand all the time, I mean, that's going to eat up a fair amount of uh, resource for us. So uh, we tend to have a kind of a, a balancing act where uh, we certainly do it at the time of upload. We do it at the time of download. Uh, we do it every 90 days. And, and if, if the user wants to run it more often than that, then they're certainly free to do so from whatever application environment they have. So it definitely fixie checks don't come for free. We'd like to think they're not as necessarily in, in object storage just because of all the uh, replication that we do in that environment, but you're certainly welcome to run them as often as you like. Great. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Sam, um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Sure. Um, just trying to think of what I could add here. So I think one thing to elaborate on a little bit um, would be, again, the sort of de decentralized nature of, of the Meta Archive network. Um, so I sort of touched on this in that, you know, there are these, these peer storage nodes that have copies, um, including, you know, the, the checksum values, the hashes for, for the files that they have copies of. Um, and, but when, you know, when a checksum verification occurs, it's not referring to sort of a centralized database um, where that sort of, you know, pulling from some sort of master list of all the, the checksum values in the network. It's really based on what a given peer has stored locally. Um, so there's no sort of centralized um, like fixity uh, check service that's being managed in any kind of central network infrastructure. We do have central network infrastructure that you know, manages sort of the, the, the database of all of the, the content in the network, um, but the fixity itself is again sort of baked in, designed into the, the lock software protocol. So, in that way, because of the sort of randomized nature, um, these, these verifications and integrity checks are proceeding on a regular basis, but um, it's not that they all have to sort of complete at a specific time um, to say that now, 
you know, all of the copies of all of the content in the network have had a fixed fee check performed. Um, so that said, you know, and that's, that again is based on not just trying to prevent risks like bit rot, but other kinds of, you know, intrusions, um, other kinds of, you know, maybe militia t attacks to a network. Um, again, these sort of go beyond um, what we're just talking about here. But all that said, yes, you know, when, when there is a uh, sort of unit of content that is significantly large, so whether that's, you know, lots of files, uh, individual small files, or, or that's actually more of a challenging scenario in terms of those, uh, you know, again, ongoing uh, randomized integrity checks being performed, having those uh, sort of complete uh, and be successful. Um, so again, we're looking at infrastructure that's being hosted locally, that there, have, there are a set of technical requirements in terms of, you know, the hardware, um, the computing resources. Um, and so for, you know, some institutions that are meeting the, the minimum requirements, those machines may take a little longer to uh, perform those checks, whereas, you know, so other institutions that are, you know, can, can uh, basically throw more, more computing resources um, uh, at the server that's, that's hosting the content, um, then you can get through uh, a, a larger set of, of these polls um, over time. Um, so we definitely recommend, um, you know, some, some structures in terms of maybe limiting the sort of unit sizes, um, haven't quite set upper threshold for, you know, number of files, but it's, it's something that I would say uh, MedArchive has been working in cooperation with its members um, to, to come up with some, some tunings and some best practices um, for as, you know, they put together their own content packages and put them into the, into the network. Um, at least that's, that's how things work now. There's, there should be some opportunities to uh, expand uh, and uh, automate and enhance, uh, I'd say, this, this basic uh, integrity checking function of, of locks in the sort of new, new re-architected re re version of locks, um, locks 2.0, that's, that's going to be starting to be released uh, next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's um, it's it's a great point to sort of underscore, and you know, I'm I'm certainly noting it. I uh, I'm sure the folks on the call here are too. That each of you, you know, in your your environments and your systems, you're you're having to uh, do some magic in the background to make sure that the the data is structured in the ways that work well with your systems, and at the same time, you're sort of um, providing the assurances to the data provider that um, you know what they put in is you know, what they're going to get back out again. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this, it raises this whole other dimension of data integrity, which is a concern around sort of maintaining intellectual control and organization of data between a data depositors, um, original local copies and the cop copies that are at rest in your persistent storage environments. Um, you know, some storage environments assign new identifiers uh, to files, um, or they um, will um, do some editing of file names. Um, sometimes large aggregations of data um, do in fact, you know, to some degree, like what you're saying, Sam, need to be disaggregated uh, in order to align with um, a services data models. So um, I wonder if you can say a little bit more about how your systems uh, impact um, a depositor's data organization and maybe it's sort of things at their metadata level, um, if at all. And, um, you know, well, just to sort of say a little bit explicitly, if you can, uh, whether or not um, depositors have to do some, will have to do some sort of work to rebuild um, or reorganize their collections uh, if they have to engage in a bit of egress for their data uh, from out of your systems. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with, uh, with Jim. Uh, yeah, so for us, it's actually pretty straightforward, meaning we don't change any aspect of the file structure or the file metadata when it's transferred to us. So whatever you send us is whatever you're going to get back uh, on, the, on the egress side of things. So uh, I think that's the way that uh, S3 style logic storage uh, works in, data, in general. So we're not deduplicating, we're not changing any encryption parameters and things like that. So it makes it pretty easy from a retrieval side of things on, on the application side of things. And I did just want to expand on one thing as it, as it pertains to egress, because so certainly we're, we're sensitive to the topic of egress and the, and, the, and the cost of egress. In addition to not charging for it, um, we have done a direct peering with the internet to environment. So 
Uh, sometimes I think Andrew was talking a little bit about bandwidth challenges and things like that. So we're trying to do our part by not only not charging for it, but making high-speed connectivity available via direct peering in the context of things like uh, Internet 2 or starting to look at doing connectivity with some of the regional educational networks as well or, or, or the REDS. Great. Thanks, Jim. Kenton and Sam, do um, you want to say a little bit more um, about, about what that looks like from MedArchive? Sure. Um, yeah, similar, you know, what, what goes in is what comes out. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's no change or manipulation of, of data. Um, you know, if, if people, if depositors, members provide metadata about the data, then it's really treated as, um, you know, another Bitstream or set of bit streams that, that are preserved and would be available. Um, so that's definitely where we have encouraged members to um, document anything structural or you know anything that's going to be important in terms of you know some future unknown date in terms of a, a need for for restoration. Um, you know, recognizing that. Um, if that metadata includes documentation about a particular software application that that may not exist anymore. Um, so uh, we, we really try and provide at, at least some best practices and guidance, but, but don't enforce any kind of specific requirements um, around uh, the data structure or, or organization. Um, and, and similarly, uh, you know, there's no, uh, fees or sort of extra charges for for restoration um, of of data at some eventual point. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. And then Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, um, we, as I mentioned earlier, AP Trust uses Bagot format um, both when the depositor is submitting materials and when they're restoring materials, they're going to get back the bag. Um, so that's the only structure that we require. But what we found after a couple of years of operation was um, some of our depositors were choosing their bagging strategy based on how they thought they would be restoring items. And we initially allowed depositors to restore only at the object level. And um, in practice, that meant if you bag an entire collection that turns out to be a terabyte and you want to retrieve one file from that collection, um, you had to retrieve the whole terabyte. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, some of our depositors started bagging at the uh, object level. So instead of a a bag containing a collection of a thousand items, they would send us a thousand bags, each with one item. And um, we eventually implemented single file restoration so that it, we didn't want people making their packaging decisions based on that. You know, we wanted them to be able to package as they pleased without uh, having to consider the repercussions of <laughs> what happens when I need to get one file. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, and I can, I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, here at uh, Grand Valley, we, um, we're making use of Glacier for our offsite dark storage. And uh, I do have to think about, you know, the so, sort of uh, data footprint totality of uh, our collections and how to, how to structure those in Glacier so that in the event that we, you know, we want to recover or recoup um, files or subsets of collections or collections in their entirety that we can do that at a at a sustainable rate and at a low cost rate. Um, so I think uh, what you all are doing to sort of align with the needs of institutions on those levels and um, you know what Wasabi is sort of coming into the into into the arena with a bit of a game changer in terms of no costs and egress. Um, it's really 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 interesting stuff. Um, Okay, so uh, la last question, and um, uh, we'll try and cap this off at the top of the hour. Uh, but uh, you know, 
folks are actively making changes to their collections. So as they deposit uh, their collections in your environments and um, you know, they're, they're doing things like migrating file formats or performing normalization or just uh, enriching, enhancing their metadata, they're wanting to make changes to what they've previously uh, put at rest in your environment. So I'm wondering if you could each just sort of uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, what sort of support you have uh, in place within your environments to support that that sort of uh, activity. Um, you know, uh, how, are you, how are you supporting um, versioning schemes for data? Um, how, um, how easy or difficult is it for people to interface with their content uh, in, in these storage environments? And um, I'm gonna uh, sort of reverse things here and I'm gonna start with you, Andrew. Um, so yeah, we found that depositors actually update metadata much more frequently than they update um, the collections that the metadata are describing. Um, and the metadata that they typically submit with their bag and it may be, it's often an XML format. And so AP Trust has an update mechanism where if you had initially uploaded a bag containing a terabyte of files and you wanna update just a handful of files in that bag, you can upload a new bag with the same name that has say the five files you want to update and um, we will overwrite those five files with the new ones you sent and we'll leave the rest intact. So that's sort of a compromise versioning scheme where you can never get back to the original version, but you can uh, update portions of, of a collection with new files. We found in practice, it has a few pitfalls. Um, sometimes our depositors don't understand why the bag they get back contains different files from what they had initially submitted. So uh, we actually, when we send their bag back and they restore it, we include a list of all the premise events in that bag so that they can see that these five files were re-ingested on such and such date and they had new checksums and whatnot. Um, yeah, I would like to be able to support full versions um, so that depositors can choose to restore the entirety of version one of a bag or the entirety of version two. We're not there. I don't know if, if we'll get there, but um, yeah, they do, our depositors do seem to like the ability to update portions of a collection without having to re-upload the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you, you know, just sort of giving a real candid uh, take on where things are at uh, with AP Trust and with this, with this, you know, sort of uh, activity uh, in particular, it's, it's, it's very challenging um, and it's, it's not easy for um, services to provide full support across the, the entire um, set of changes that, that one would like to make. So. Um, but Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about what this looks like from MedArchive? Sure. I mean, just just building building on that, and that that versioning is clearly an area where where many many institutions are looking for more more automation and efficiency, right? So more more direct connections between storage systems and live environments like repository systems. So um, yeah, I mean, some of the efforts with the Beyond the Repository 2 project with the one to many grant, I think they're really sort of leading the way and, you know, putting together some, some actionable results towards um, how, how systems can achieve a, a higher level of interoperability. So all that said, um, and that, you know, the, the locks team is involved in um, some degree uh, with a couple of those projects. Um, so hopefully some, some advances will be made in, in the coming months um, in terms of how things work right now um, with, with the ingest process there, there is an opportunity for uh, versions to be created, new versions to be created um, via the, the crawling aspect. So, 
um, there's, there's some advantage to that. So if, you know, if you have content and it's, it's, at, it's staged for ingest, it can be crawled again. Um, and if there's new content there, new files, metadata, um, that will be added to the sort of package or unit and the original versions will be kept as well. Um, it gets it gets a little more challenging, complicated with with some with bagot based ingests. Um, less to do with the ingest function, I think more with the preparation. So as members are creating bags, um, you know, just the again trying to make that as streamlined and automated as possible. If you know, at a future step would be having to sort of open up the bag and add a new a new file i think you're starting to get into more sort of manual operations which clearly clearly don't scale um and or if uh you know bags are being ingested in some sort of serialized format then from from the systems perspective the locks perspective it sees that as sort of a, a single object rather than a you know a set of a set of files that make up a sort of unserialized bag. Um, and sorry for getting all technical talking about serialized and non-serialized. Um, but just to say that there, there, I think there is a, a recognized limitation um, in, in providing support for version versioning within lock systems. Again, there are some opportunities for um, how that will be improved in LOX 2.0. And, I, and I, I hope and and would like to continue to hopefully contribute to some of these larger you know, cross cross community efforts um, towards dealing specifically with this issue um, and achieving a uh, better better level of, of automation because it's it's not that these kinds of needs are 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 sort of going to go away. This is clearly what what's going to need to happen going forward, even even if there are a variety of different workflows outside of say just repository environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there again, uh, Sam, I just appreciate being, you know, sort of candid about the, the state of things. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to learn for, you know, all of these different services, um, you know, as we engage more with single institutions and with membership organizations. Um, it's just a fact, you know, every institution has a different set of perspectives on what should be versioned when, whether it's, you know, the first thing and the last thing or everything in between. Um, and uh, so I know I've had conversations uh, with the folks at Wasabi and uh, they have some nuanced thinking around this. Jim, do you want to just kind of talk about how this is taking shape for, for you all? Uh, sure. So, so we see heavy, heavy use of versioning with, it, with regard to our preservation customers as well as our worm style or immutability storage. So certainly that's, that's one way to achieve it. And then um, as uh, Andrew was talking about, I mean, we could certainly uh, allow the metadata to be updated independently of, of the object data itself. So we, that's a very common use case for us where people are updating metadata, but not the underlying file. So very much compatible with, with um, Andrew and Sam's thinking on this. Okay. Great. So uh, what uh, I want to leave some time for uh, questions that folks who have shown up for the, the talk uh, can throw into the mix. And uh, at this point, I'm going to, I'm going to just ask that uh, each of the panelists uh, maybe just say a few last minute remarks, uh, things that they'd like to leave you with. And, uh, and I want to use maybe the next few minutes too to just uh, encourage each of you as the panelists here to, uh, to ask some questions of your co-panelists. Um, and while folks are throwing any questions that they might have into the chat, uh, we'll let you guys say a few last uh, minute remarks about each of your um, different platforms and services, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So um, Jim, do you want to just kind of wrap things up for Wasabi? Uh, sure. So, so you know, thank you for the opportunity, Matt, and for everyone else that joined the call this afternoon. I, I, I think that, you know, the three pillars of what Wasabi does in terms of price, performance, and, and protection, I, I think are very well aligned with the objectives of preservation environments. And you know, I think some of the things we talked about today about the importance of maintaining some degree of fixity in, in the context of, of object storage, so certainly we're compatible with that. And then everything we're doing from a perspective of not charging for egress, not charging for requests, not charging for API requests, I think is very much compatible with the goals of, of doing preservation in, in with the highest degree of integrity, but also with the highest degree of cost savings. Great, thanks, Jim. Then Sam? Sure, yeah, thanks again. It was really uh, great to be a part of 
part of the, the conversation. Um, I guess I would just close on, on saying that, um, you know, I mentioned a lot about locks because it was kind of, you know, technical, technical details, but I think, I think from Meta Archive's perspective, um, you know, really just continuing to fulfill its, its mission of uh, a sort of cooperative effort uh, of cultural heritage institutions doing digital preservation themselves, you know, that kind of mission alignment. Um, but also recognizing that, that hosting infrastructure is, is a challenge and that um, it's, it's uh, sort of going against the trend to continue to uh, house the, the actual physical structures um, for, for doing this kind of work. So, so Meta Archive right now is in a moment of, of sort of deep consideration and engagement with its membership and, and, and looking at, at opportunities for, for evolution and transformation. Um, and you know, really trying to you know, consider a lot of the kinds of possibilities that are out there for continuing to, again, fulfill its mission, but uh, perhaps uh, you know, shift and change the way that that mission is, is fulfilled um, and it'll be really driven by the membership. So yeah, just really great to hear um, what, what other, other entities are doing um, and uh, you know, looking forward to uh, continuing those com conversations and, and other, other venues as well. Fantastic, thanks, Sam. Um, and then uh, Andrew, I'll let you uh, say a few remarks. Yeah, AP Trust is still um, really focusing on expanding our uh, options that we offer to our depositors, expanding storage options and uh, services. And we're trying to make this kind of service available more broadly to institutions that have fewer resources. So that's where our focus is um, for the foreseeable future. That's great. Um, and I'm gonna have a question uh, before we wrap up for each of you about you know, how best uh, the community can continue to engage each one of you in uh, you know, both the separate ways that you, um, that you engage institutions, um, and, but maybe some common ones as well. But uh, there's a question from uh, Don, uh, and Andrew, I, I do see your question there. I'm gonna uh, go ahead and let some of the attendees um, get their questions in and then we'll circle around. Um, but uh, so Don has a question for Wasabi. Um, are the results of your fixity checking shared with the customer? This question to you, Jim. Uh, yeah, no, so yeah, I just posted the answer in the chat. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. so, so generally the, the fixity checks, if, if we ever have a problem and across our 11,000 customers, I can think of uh, one or two cases where um, that's been an issue where it's been a, um, a, a zone on a particular disk block that, that's had a challenge and we've been able to rebuild that based on the copies that we have. When I, when I talked earlier about having a, 20 copies of, of the file. Um, so we certainly report that out to the customer that's affected, but it's uh, not something that affects all 11,000 customers. So it tends to be localized to uh, one or two customers who might be using that particular disk block. Okay, great. And then uh, just again to reiterate, um, I think you made it pretty clear, Jim, that uh, you know at any point in time, you know, someone has everything at their disposal to uh, to perform a bit of their own spot check within. Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, it's whatever application level function. So if you're working with an application that's pushing data to S3 style object storage, whether it's ours or, or someone else's, those applications and tools generally have their own uh, fixity checking schedules and, and capabilities and if they ever discovered a problem, then you'd be able to leverage that reporting mechanism as well. So this is something we're doing independent of what the applications uh, are doing themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, so Don, Don's got a uh, sort of a follow-up uh, statement here, uh, and this is great because you know he, he's making it real clear what what their desired use case is. And um, I'll say, you know, from the cloud studies perspective, one of the things we're hoping to accomplish is a is a bit of a a set of resources that you know we can put in front of uh, providers like you all there at Wasabi and others, Amazon, um, you know whomever it may be, that that paints a, a bit of a nuanced picture for what some of these use cases are uh, from institutions. Uh, what 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 Don is saying is they'd like to be able to audit any particular file bag and be able to see. Uh, sounds like from 
from within your environment, you know, you say you, say you do uh, checks every 90 days. Um, would like to be able to see the result of those checks in some sort of a report. Yeah, no, I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, in terms of, uh, I, I think part of the challenge is, is that um, within the S3 standard itself, which is really the, the, the method we've chosen for uh, supporting the interface between your application environment and our storage service, there's no real mechanism for us to, to, uh, to do that. So, you know, we, we would have to implement our own kind of uh, API for, for that message exchange. It's, it's something within the uh, Hollywood ETC organization. They have some ideas about how to do fixity checks on, on demand and we're kind of seeing how that evolves. So it's, it's not that we're adverse to sharing the information. It's about the mechanism of how your storage application would ask for that and then how we would report it back. So that, that's part of the challenge to, to think about. So if, if someone's aware of any standards activities uh, beyond what the ETC is up to, then um, uh, that would be helpful guidance for us. That's great. Okay, and, and I'll, um, I'll just go ahead and invite people to, um, if you prefer to unmute your mic at this point and ask a direct question, uh, you're invited to do so. Um, or just continue to, to feel free to make use of the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay, um, well, so uh, I guess, again, my last question to you all is, uh, you know, uh, we need to continue to sort of in, engage these sorts of issues. I mean, I think that there's, uh, as all of you have said, there's research to be done about how to align your system services with the uh, change management needs of institutions, um, learning a little bit more uh, about uh, how folks like AP Trust can leverage cloud uh, systems, uh, and you know, continue to move some of their services to those environments, and at the same time, uh, be able to maintain a bit of independence and uh, control, particularly on behalf of the institutions that you know are sort of um, uh, engaging that that service from a governance perspective, from a membership perspective, um, which is you know certainly uh, at at its you know uh, most full, I think, in sort of the the meta archive model. Um, so, can you? Can, can each of you just sort of say like from your perspectives, how best can, um, can you continue to sort of engage this community, these sectors? Um, what sort of venues, what sort of channels, um, if you could each just, just sort of respond to that briefly. Um, yeah, David Friend here. Um, yeah, hey David. So, you know, we, we are uh, really trying to put together uh, a substantial network of partners and uh, you know a lot of what it goes on in data storage is not just the physical storage of the data itself which you know we're obviously good at but the applications that help people manage the data uh, and the metadata and uh, you know we're committed to working with uh, organizations that provide that layer of usability that sits on top of the the actual raw storage Mm. And, uh, you know, so certainly, uh, you know, anybody that has, um, you know, a data storage archival or otherwise uh, need uh, and are, is working with a partner who maybe so far has not uh, had an opportunity to work with Wasabi, we'd certainly be happy to have an introduction and to find some way to uh, incorporate that because uh, unlike the hyperscalers that have, uh, at this point, literally hundreds of cloud applications, we're not going beyond storage. We think storage itself is, uh, you know, one of the world's largest uh, IT opportunities. Uh, the migration of data from on-prem to the cloud is probably only going to happen once. And, uh, you know, so our, our goal is to work with other companies that can help us get there. Fantastic. Sam? Um can you say a few words about uh, how best uh, you all would like to work with institutions going forward? Sure. I mean, I think I think just sort of reiterating that that again, from a cooperative perspectives perspective, Meta Archive is really driven by sort of 
member needs and uh, with the sort of diversity of types of institutions, there are a variety of different needs, <laughs> um, which, which means that uh, we're very open, I think, to, uh, you know, learning from and trying to understand uh, where institutions are at. And I, I feel like we have pretty good experience, particularly with those institutions that are really just getting started um, and you know, thinking about issues of data storage is maybe one task on a list of many, many other things. Um, so, you know, trying trying to make the process of in, of engaging and doing this work uh, comfortable and and you know that they have support amongst the community of practice. Um, so that way, I would feel like you know, in addition to uh, my availability as sort of a point person or community manager there's a lot of availability on the part of, of other members that are you know, currently a part of the cooperative to engage in, in you know, initial kinds of conversations. So yeah, I, I'd encourage folks, if you, uh, you know, see people on the members list to reach out to people directly, I've heard nothing but, but positive feedback from people who have done that. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm here to have those kinds of conversations as well. Fantastic. And then Andrew? Um, we have uh, semi-annual in-person meetings with all of our depositors and then quarterly tech calls with our depositors. And that's, those are mainly to understand their concerns and needs. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of the other non-technical people in AP Trust uh, attend quite a few conferences to uh, meet up with others outside the AP Trust community to let them know about us. Sometimes they bring on new members. Um, sometimes they're just learning what other services are out there uh, that we may want to offer. So um, we also keep a couple of Slack channels open and we are very good about monitoring and responding to emails to help at AP Trust. So we have several channels open to, for communication with the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on these sorts of levels, I guess I'll just highlight, we have you know, one major conference that's uh, just kicking off now, IPRES in Amsterdam. That's, a, that's another great uh, place to, to catch up with these different um, service providers, uh, PASIG, uh, the Code for Lib, um, both the, the, um, the international and the, and the regionals. Um, the open repositories conferences, I think those are, these are all really great places for uh, people to, uh, to approach you all uh, with their use cases, with their questions and, and get more information. And for, um, you know, I know AP Trust and Meta Archive, you guys are sort of uh, right in the thick of all those different communities. Um, but uh, David, David, uh, Jim, Wasabi, um, keep those events on your radar. Um, great places and opportunities to engage the cultural and uh, the scholarly sectors for sure. Um, so uh, we're uh, we're definitely at our, our at our time limit in terms of what we set up uh, for for holding the panel and the conversations. Uh, if folks have further questions, uh, make sure to distribute the contact information that everybody's provided in the chat already. But hit the chat and um, pull those those emails down from uh, from each of our panelists here. And I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to both the Davids from Wasabi, uh, Jim. Uh, from Wasabi, Sam from Meta Archive, and Andrew from AP Trust. Uh, thanks a ton for for coming on this afternoon and uh, taking some time out from your afternoon to to um, to talk with us and talk with each other. Um, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, everybody. Everybody have a good rest of their their day um, and week, and uh, we'll see several of you at the national conference in Tampa uh, next month. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye all. Bye bye. bye everyone.